good evening good afternoon good morning to all of you who are joining this uh, session the skill building session a very warm welcome to all of you um, who are joining this uh, skill building session on discourse analysis my name is uh, rakhal uh, i am a professor in the achutamanan center for health science studies um, in uh, trivandrum kerala and um, i will be facilitating this session and thought i would uh, share a few words uh, before uh, we get into this uh, session what brings uh, all the speakers in this session together is the fact that uh, in engaging with an hpsr question uh, in our respective research uh, we were led to or literally stumbled upon uh, discourse analysis and da proved uh, provided each of us uh, with tools and methods and perspectives that helped plumb the depths of the questions we were researching and greatly excited us thus no one in this session claims to be an expert on discourse analysis but we would like to share what we have experienced and what excited us what brought us together was a sense of mutual respect and for sharing uh, the sort of experiences that we had secondly as i said we aim to share in this session how each one of us used discourse to answer the particular questions that we were asking in our research so this is more about how each one of us applied the tools and methods of da rather than a class on discourse as such now discourse of course has come uh, become more and more important and become more and more uh, uh, talked about and used in the field of uh, hpsr especially i think with the sort of disillusionment uh, of a strictly top down comprehensive rationalist approach to policy and uh, implementation and the more we see and recognize policy as a multi level iterative and a complex process we recognize immediately the uh, extreme importance of uh, ideas and meaning and that naturally leads us to discourse the plan of this session is that we will have two uh, introductory uh, uh, presentations by uh, first by michel and then by uh, adam this will be followed uh, by four uh, presentations um, where uh, researchers will share briefly about how they approached how they used discourse uh, in their particular research research uh, fee, research questions the first presenter will be tanya followed by aida and then sudha and finally finally eleanor after these four presentations we will have a 20 minute uh, panel discussion where adam will uh, field questions that will help us uh, to the presenters that will help us understand their research and the way they use discourse in a slightly more in depth uh, manner after this session of uh, panel discussion we will open the uh, floor uh to field questions uh from the audience uh just a few uh housekeeping uh rules uh so uh for those of you who have uh, clarificatory questions or who are directing questions to the speakers kindly use the uh, q and a uh, chat box on our, on the right of your screens we had also promised to share with all of you a small little toolkit of resources that we found useful uh, a sort of starters toolkit for those of you who are interested in uh, receiving this kindly uh, uh, put your email addresses in the discussion form uh, uh, that you will find uh, there email with these few words uh, i will now um, start off the uh, session the first speaker is uh, dr michel dijon 
Michelle is a postdoctoral scholar with experience using DA to explore public conceptualizations of health and how they are influenced by neoliberal discourses in health policy. Uh, may I request the presentation of Michelle? Discourse Analysis, Theoretical Independence. Social Constructionism. Social Constructionism provides us with a specific way of understanding truth, reality, and knowledge. Social Constructionists question the way knowledge itself is understood, and they are critical of the assumption that what we observe is, an, is a reflection of the true nature of the world. For Social Constructionists, language is very important. So, our identities, our social relations, and the way we experience our, our environment are all viewed as constructed through language we use at specific moments in history. So language isn't, isn't viewed as a neutral representation of an objective external reality. Instead, language constructs our reality. Language constrains what we can and can't say and what we can and can't understand. In this way, language is viewed as constraining what we experience and what we can per perceive. Social constructionists also emphasize the importance of social interactions as the side of this construction. So meaning is collaboratively constructed and reproduced through language and between people. We see this in the policy making process, which involves multiple social interactions where language is used in different ways to construct reality and to construct different health problems, different understandings about who is ill and who is not, as well as who is deserving of health and care and what this health and care should look like. Discourse. So I thought it would be useful to just define um, discourse. Um, before we go any further, so Parker defines discourses as sets of statements that construct objects and an array of subject positions. Um, and then Cheek talks about how a discourse is made up of certain assumptions that are often taken for granted as true. So I think this definition by Cheek is really useful because um, it points to how discourses are often not visible um, and they sort of operate at a level out of our kind of conscious awareness um, and so I also thought it would be useful to point out how discourses can be broad and they can be specific and an example of this might be um, neoliberalism as a discourse which I, I know Eleanor is going to talk about a little bit later um, and so neoliberalism is a broad discourse which has a range of implications for how our society is structured politically economically socially um, within societies where neoliberal discourses are, are dominant, things like freedom, individual responsibility and self-sufficiency are highly valued. So this could have a range of, of implications for, for health policy. For example, at a broad level, um, things like budget allocation for things um, like health promotion may be very limited. But we also see this discourse evidence in how some policies implicitly view the solution to health problems. So an example might be um, an overemphasis on, on education as a way of curbing HIV in infection. So while this is definitely a useful strategy, prioritizing this kind of education approach um, over other kinds of approaches may be evidence of an implicit understanding of health as the responsibility of individuals who, given the right information, should work to avoid illness. Um, and so analyzing these kinds of discursive constructions um, in a policy setting allows us to unpack some of these implicit assumptions. Um, and by making these assumptions visible and tracking the implications for different groups in different contexts, we can try to expose, thing, uh, expose inequalities. Um, and once we've done this, we can start to develop new ways of constructing policies, which may foster more socially just and transformative health systems. <laughs> 
power. So central to the discussion of discourse is the discussion of power. And one of the key writers in this area is Foucault. Um, and he defines power in a number of different ways. So one example is, is there on the slide. Power is not an institution, not a structure, neither is it a, is it a certain strength we are endowed with. It is a name that one attributes to a complex strategic situation in a particular society. So more specifically in, it, in the context of discourse analysis, Parker talks about the links between discourse and power. Um, and he discusses it, um, how we should go about analyzing power when, when doing discourse analysis. And so he encourages, encourages us to ask ourselves things like which groups of people, which ideas, which institutions are being supported or benefiting from different discourses. Um, and thus, who is motivated to reproduce or reinforce certain discourses. Um, and then, on the other hand, which institutions, people, ideas are undermined or silenced? And um, who, may, who may aim to suppress different discourses? So, Parker argues that we need to show how a discourse connects with other discourses to sanction oppression. Um, and this kind of provides a, um, a social responsibility to discourse analytic research, where um, an analysis of power is intended to make visible systems of inequality in an attempt to overcome them. Um, an example of, of discourse being used for po political purposes in a policy making context can be seen in an attempt in South Africa to ban alcohol advertisements in sports. So after there was this proposed policy there was a meeting on um, the role of alcohol advertising in sports and alcohol industry representatives drew on a scarce resources discourse to argue that the alcohol industry was in fact saving the government money by sponsoring sporting events which would otherwise need to be supported by government budgets. And here we see how language is being used to promote the interests of a specific group um, and reproduce the, the status quo. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about time. So a number of the researchers who are going to be presenting later show how discourses are, have a history and are specific to, to certain time periods. So we'll see how discourses change over time and how they refer back to each other and to other discourses which came, which came before them. Um, discourses sometimes replace and alter other discourses. Um, and this process has political implications. Um, and then relating back to what we talked about, about power, discourses allow certain people to make history move in a certain way. Um, and then the dominance of powerful discourses emerge over time and through repeated use. Um, and the power of different discourses often develops over very long stretches of time. And so tracing the history of, of how different discourses originated enables us to begin to understand their dominance in, in different contexts. Um, and this uh, provides us with insight into how we arrived at the status quo and perhaps what we can do to, to alter it. Thanks uh, very much, uh, uh, Michelle, uh, for uh, laying out um, the sort of basic concepts uh, of uh, discourse, social constructionism, discourse, power, and time. Um, I now uh, will uh, call upon um, Dr. Adam Kuhn, who is a faculty of the Johns Hopkins University, United States. Uh, Adam has experience uh, conducting uh, framing research on health financing politics and teaches ideas based approaches to analyzing the health policy process. Uh, over to you, Adam. Thank you, Raquel. Um, so I'm pleased today to speak about uh, ideas uh, um, that kind of underpin health policy and systems research, as well as ideas as a, a mode of inquiry or focus of inquiry, inquiry in health policy and systems research. Um, 
So Michelle helpfully kind of traced uh, some of the theoretical underpinnings for discourse analysis. And I'll talk a little bit about later um, uh, in, a, in a few minutes about disentangling discourse from other ideas-based approaches. Um, the theoretical underpinnings of an ideas-based uh, approach to policy analysis are really rooted in, um, uh, can go all the way back to the origins of sociology and are rooted in the convergence of continental philosophy through phenomenology uh, and American pragmatism, hermeneutics, and then post-structuralism, post-modernism. Um, but for our purposes today, I, I think it would be helpful to start on kind of uh, from the policy um, analysis perspective. Um, what do we mean when we're talking about ideas? Um, and to understand that, we need to remind ourselves what it is we're trying to do when we do policy analysis. So following um, Peter Johns in his, in his textbook, Analyzing Public Policy, he argues that um, all um, uh, public policy research kind of falls into two camps. It's either research on policy dynamics, um, trying to understand uh, how policies do or do not change um, over time, or research on policy variation. So looking at comparing policies across sectors or administrative units such as uh, between countries or um, comparing policy variation within countries themselves. Um, and I think it's, uh, for, for me, um, in my research, I've been most interested in, in why policy changes. Um, but the different intentions of policy analysis will lead you to different um, uh, sets of methods and, and questions. So in, a, in this conception of kind of research traditions in policy analysis, Johns helpfully distinguishes between interests, uh, institutions, and ideas-based approaches. And then he also covers some of the more um, kind of synthetic models like um, uh, Kingdon's three streams and policy advocacy coalitions and punctuated equilibriums, uh, equilibrium. Um, but it's helpful to start with kind of the origins of policy studies and look at really uh, the, the interest-based um, modes of analyzing policy. Um, uh, as you can see, this is just a screenshot from banners um, that I've, uh, I've pulled from online. Um, but we're surrounded by competing interests, particularly in the field of global health, because health is a kind of complex endeavor. Um, and we, we oftentimes take for granted what these interests are. Um, but this also gets to the heart of, you know, interest-based, the pros and cons of interest-based modes of inquiry. Um, so, for example, it's, it can be helpful to understand conflict by understanding people's perceived motivations. Um, but it's also problematic because what are those interests? Are they material? Are they ideational or performative? Um, are they short-term interests or are they long-term strategic interests? We all know that interests change over time. Um, people may have to make decisions on policy without really knowing what their interests are. Um, and uh, perhaps more importantly, people, uh, uh, policymakers um, and, and um, citizens do make decisions uh, counter to their interests all the time. So institutions-based scholarship um, really focuses on understanding the forces that constrain social and economic uh, uh, life. Um, and this can be kind of divided into two camps, uh, uh, formal institutions, which is the study of like laws, uh, uh, the development of legislatures over time, electoral systems, etc., as well as um, informal institutions such as beliefs, norms, um, etc. Um, early, earlier institutional research really kind of took organizational, uh, you know, interest groups and organizational action as uh, the focus of um, an institution. Um, but there was a shift in the mid 80s to understand institutions as the rules of the game. And as this cartoon illustrates, um, uh, without institutions, without rules, um, social life is fairly chaotic. Uh, and that's the importance for constraining behavior. Um, for this reason, institutions are particularly good at understanding policy stasis, um, things like path dependency, um, but they're less nimble to um, look at why policy changes very quickly or suddenly sometimes. Um, uh, Institution-based modes of inquiry do uh, tend to be, for, for this reason, they're, they're good at analyzing incremental slow change in, over broad historical periods. Um, uh, but a lot of 
the problems with institutions are what ideas-based scholars um, argue is beca simply because institutions are, are like congealed ideas. They're, they, they're um, composed of ideas themselves. So for our purposes today, uh, we're going to talk about ideas-based modes of, of, of policy research. And um, you can see uh, from this, uh, these two, the juxtaposition of these two images, then when we move to talking about ideas, we're talking about things that are oftentimes deeply felt. And we're talking about how people make sense uh, of, of phenomena in the world around them. And this takes on a symbol, oftentimes a symbolic uh, quality. So in the figure to, in the, in the photo to the left, um, a cross burning on somebody's front yard in the southern part of the United States in particular means something different than a cross shining in the back of a church. One image is tied to a legacy of, of at times, state-sanctioned violence, uh, political intimidation, racism, uh, and which instills fear. Um, whereas another image is, uh, is tied to notions of uh, spiritual purity, um, moral behavior and ethic of, of comporting oneself in everyday life, sense of community, and provides a, a, for a sense of security. So they're both crosses, but they mean very different things and in some cases are very painful uh, and deeply felt uh, feelings. And I'd argue that uh, politicians know this, which is why uh, you hear in the realm of talk politics, people talking very symbolically. Um, so when we think of ideas uh, and how um, uh, in the policy process they're wielded for, uh, strategically, some, some scholars argue that all politics and all policy making boils down to a contest of ideas. Deborah Stone argues that some of these can be think, uh, thought of as conflicts over goals. So these could be social values such as equity, um, welfare, security, efficiency, etc. Um, but they could also be over um, uh, conflicts over how to define a problem. And uh, oftentimes uh, actors competing to define a problem in a way that uh, is amenable to the solutions they have uh, readily at their disposal. So if we move to... Um, uh, if we move to looking in the policy analysis space that's more focused on the, um, the, the health sector specifically, Catherine Smith has, help, um, has kind of uh, elaborated a little bit more. It resembles Deborah Stone's earlier conception of, of, of ideas. Um, but Catherine Smith uses, cites Daniel Bailan to argue that um, uh, ideas are really located at three distinct levels in the policy process. Um, the first is, uh, is as depicted as ideologies and broad organizing frameworks. And this brings to the fore um, uh, the role of values. And as such, it's connected to um, other um, large concepts such as policy paradigms and the referential. The second interpretation of ideas is found in the agenda setting uh, literature. Um, so this is usually an intermediate level where ideas are taken as policy frames um, and can be characterized as weapons of advocacy or wielded, uh, that are wielded for purposes of strategic gain. Um, this helps to define problems, but it also uh, uh, identifies and locates parties privy to the controversy. And finally, the third level um, is really on simple policy proposals themselves. Um, so it's, while this heuristic is, is, can be helpful, it's important to note, as uh, Daniel Bailan has reminded us, that um, ideas oftentimes assume various forms and can coexist at multiple levels in policy research. That said, um, uh, scholars have consistently cautioned against using vague catch-all concepts such as ideas simply because uh, they extend their influence to too many types of social phenomena to be theoretically useful. Um, the book on the right is uh, an edited volume by Daniel Bailon and Robert Henry Cox, um, where they, uh, they kind of sample, um, it's about 10 years old, where they sample the terrain of uh, political and sociological research on um, ideas and policy studies. Um, and one of the things that the trends that kind of, they take as their operating definition, ideas as causal beliefs, which is somewhat of a narrow approach. Um, but but the theme that emerges is that ideas are good for explaining change, um, but, they, but they are ambiguous. And Peter Johns in his, uh, in his policy analysis textbook uh, points out that, um, and some of the more interpretive and theoretical versions of ideas-based research, um, they become philosophical treatments as opposed to empirical research projects. Um, as Michelle helpfully kind of oriented us, um, uh, 
to discourse, I thought it would be, uh, before we get going into our panels, it's important to distinguish between kind of overlapping concepts that you oftentimes hear in ideas-based research. And these are related to discourse, uh, framing or frames, and um, narratives or stories. Um, and while it's important to note that uh, individuals, researchers, um, oftentimes use the terms interchangeably, um, and they do mean different things to different people. Um, they, there are some distinctions with it, which I think it's helpful to highlight. Raul Lejano, uh, I, and for my understanding, I drew heavily on um, a nice description from Raul Lejano and his uh, work on narrative. Um, I'm not going to cover Michelle, uh, uh, discourse analysis in detail because Michelle has given us a helpful theoretical orientation uh, um, and we'll hear a lot about it later today. Um, but that's to say that what differentiates discourse from framing and, and narratives is that it's tied to larger systems of meaning and as such it fundamentally concerns the distribution of power and knowledge within society. Framing on the other hand can be um, it, has been kind of a fractured paradigm and can mean um, different things. There's uh, kind of two camps, um, I'd argue. One is a cognitive camp, which on the left uh, you can see is concerned with the, uh, how the individual orders uh, social reality. Um, so this is a cognitive, cognitively coherent uh, uh, schema for organizing the world and understanding it, our role in it. Um, but there's less of an individualistic and more of an interactive approach that focuses on the intersubjective of, uh, uh, construction of meaning. Um, and these interactive framing approaches really look at how uh, the world is understood through frame, frame, framings that are constructed between the noses, so to speak, of multiple individuals. And then finally, when we come to narratives and stories, um, these have discrete elements. So one, uh, they are narrated by someone. Um, Two, they uh, have a, typically a sequence of events. So they have beginnings, middles, and ends. Um, they have characters that do things in them. And uh, through implotting uh, identity and action into an order, um, uh, these provide fairly plausible explanations of po uh, policy change. It almost doesn't matter how accurate they are as much as how plausible they are. Um, and so in this way, I think, uh, you know, if we think about discourses, uh, discourses broader and frames is kind of an intermediate level. Um, and that is to say that framing is part of narrative and storytelling, which is all part of a discourse. Um, and some would argue that um, uh, storytelling is constitutive of the other uh, of discourse and framing as well. Um, uh, but these distinctions are real and you will see this in um, ideas based research. Just before we get going, it's helpful to flag that there is a body of scholarship underpinned kind of by larger theoretical movements in social sciences and humanities uh, concerning the narrative turn, the interpretive turn, the argumentative turn. Um, and this is under the banner, this is kind of fallen under the banner of critical policy studies. There are flagship journals in the upper left hand corner. Um, but as this is a skills building session, um, you know, uh, thought it would be helpful to share a number of of um, kind of manuals and handbooks for how to think um, and research uh, in the ideas-based space. And a lot of these researchers share similar uh, values with, a, a, with an emphasis um, uh, to the health policy and systems research policies um, analysts. Uh, they focus on the policy, pro uh, policy as a process uh, and the primacy of ideas um, and its relationship to interests and institutions. Um, and really they question kind of the fact value uh, uh, dichotomy um, in, in the policy process. So I'm um, really looking forward to this discussion um, and I can't wait to, to hear what uh, some of the um, some of the panelists presentations coming up. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Adam, uh, for that uh, very lucid Uh, uh, Michelle and Adam's uh, two fantastic uh, presentations to uh, you know lay the ground for uh, a basic understanding of discourse and ideas. May I invite uh, Tanya to make the first presentation? Um, Tanya is a PhD candidate uh, at the School of Public Health, University of the Western Cape, uh, South Africa. She is also a consultant working with the intersections of gender, 
health systems um, and uh, social justice uh, over to you tanya good afternoon greetings everyone can you hear me yes we can tanya great thanks rakal and thank you to rakal michal and adam for leading us um, in the session so greetings to all the participants um, i live in cape town and i'm really grateful and excited about this opportunity and being part of the session today i'm going to share with you some of my experiences and reflections of using discourse analysis really focusing on the why why i used it um, and how i used it uh, moving on, so as Raquel mentioned, this is part of an overall PhD research process. Um, and some of the findings will really be expounded in a forthcoming paper in health policy and planning. And here I really want to acknowledge my co-authors, Asha George and Michelle de Jong, who's also on this panel. So essentially, um, the purpose of this paper is to do a gender analysis of the content of adolescent health policies in South Africa in order to explore how gender is constructed and to raise implications for health policy analysis and praxis. So that's really what our intention was with this particular paper. So how we ended up using CDA after lots of reading and lots of discussions, we were really guided by our phenomenon of interest. As Raquel mentioned, our question um, and our interest guided us to begin to explore critical discourse analysis. So in the work that we've done, we've used the notion of discourse as social practice um, and policies as productive. And I've listed a few authors that talk a lot more about that. Um, uh, CDA was really a relevant theoretical and analytical approach um, which allowed us to make uh, um, analytical and interpretive understandings in terms of the context, the actors, the power relations, and how this all relates um, to policy processes. It was also important to look at the relationship between these dimensions, how they reproduce each other, what is resisted, what are the dynamics, um, and as colleagues have mentioned, how things may have changed over time. And in our particular study, we focused on policy documents. Um, and that is one way of understanding how policies are socially constructed and how they interact with social and political contexts. So for our research, our data was policy documents by national government that have a mandate for policy development. Through our searches, we identified 15 key policy documents relevant to adolescent health, and these dated from 2003 to 2018. Um, along our journey, we conducted an initial thematic analysis of the content to describe what is there explicitly, um, and then use that as a basis for a more deeper interpretive analysis of the discourse. And we also drew on the work of Carol Bucky through her what's the problem represented to be approach. And this approach really explores what is problematized, what is focused on, and what is left unproblematized, what is missing or silent. And here I've just shared with you the six questions that guide the work and that form part of her framework. So I'll just give you a minute to have a browse. I'm not going through all of them. So how did we use it exactly? The things that don't really end up in all the, the methodological sections of journals. Um, we started off with a very broad identification and mapping of discourses in terms of gender and adolescent health. Uh, really just mapping what was there, what did we see, um, what emerged. The next step of our analysis was really beginning to look at the relationship between these discourses how, which ones are dominant, which ones are more marginalized, and where the silences exist in relation to gender and adolescent health. Um, and really this was important. This took us a long time of really beginning to understand these dynamic interactions, these conversations almost between the discourses, um, and really looking at all the, the different policy elements in that process. An important part of the analysis was also looking 
um, you know, using quite an iterative approach um, with my co-authors. And there was a lot of triangulation of our internal ideas and our own interpretations amongst ourselves. And we also shared this with colleagues to get their ideas in terms of, you know, what do we thought in terms of how gender was problematized and also importantly, the implications for health policy and systems research, the so what? What do we do with this analysis? How do we engage uh, potentially with policy makers and implementers in terms of our findings? Uh, just briefly for your reference as well, we mapped the actors and timelines to understand more about history and contextual changes over time. Um, so I'm going to you know, not delve into this, but just to give you a sense that that was a thread of our analysis as well. Um, and given our focus today, this slide just gives you a visual taste um, of some of our findings. And I think a key message for me here is that we um, identified the interrelated, often juxtaposed, dominant and marginalized discourses, as well as the silences. These discourses coexist, produce and reproduce each other and resist. Um, and I think it's this complex picture um, that makes for very rich findings um, and not always simple and easy, but a very rich picture emerged. And then my final slide is just um, some brief methodological reflections. I think uh, critical discourse asks us as scholars to be reflexive. And part of that means identifying um, our own positionality in relation to the interpretive research policy process. So one, one element of our positionality is that the three authors are academic researchers based at a university, and we also identify as feminist researchers. So doing the research in order to transform a particular power and gendered relationships. Um, I think another key reflection for me is that policies are not words or decontextualized texts. Um, and this is where CDA has been very helpful in making us understand how policies are socially constructed um, through and with actors and in contexts and how gender discourses are embedded in these policy documents. However, uh, using policy documents alone has certain limitations um, and in terms of understanding certain policy elements. So um, in future papers, we're going to be foregrounding the voices of actors um, and their ideological positions, their understandings um, as part of the process. And then finally, given the terrain and the vast literature um, and the history and context of different disciplines, I think one of the challenges I certainly experienced was how to integrate the richness of critical discourse analysis, as well as the richness and, and wealth of knowledge from gender analyses uh, and write largely for a health policy and systems uh, research audience, particularly when you're limited to uh, 6,000 words. Um, it was a wonderful journey um, and I really look forward to our discussions. I just want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues and my supervisor and the funding that we've received. Thanks so much, Raquel and colleagues. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Tanya, uh, for uh, sharing this uh, wonderful uh, piece of research and the nitty gritties of uh, how you actually went about using concepts uh, like, uh, you know, uh, discourse the social practice uh, and the silences and the relationships. Um, I now call upon our next uh, presenter, uh, Aida Okeyo. Uh, Ida is a PhD candidate uh, who, in fact, just uh, submitted her PhD uh, very recently, exploring how policy frames are entrenched over time and reinforced by historical uh, political moments and ultimately constrain or enable intersectoral policy action. Uh, Ida, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rakal, and thanks to everyone for joining this reflective session. Um, I will be reflecting on my own process of discourse analysis, which was really informed by using the two concepts of ideas and frames when looking at an intersectoral early childhood initiative at subnational level. So one of the things that intrigued me about the First Thousand Days initiative was that it rose onto the political agenda and it was initially described as a uh, um, intersectoral 
uh, agenda to address early childhood needs by focusing on the first two years of a child's life um, in 2016. But early on in the policy process, it was quite evident that the intersectoral goals had been lost um, or had disappeared from the policy uh, articulations from the discourse. And so what I wanted to do with the initial part of my analysis is to um, look at policy documents and interrogate why intersectoral agendas were lost, especially because in the broader field of collaborative governance, there is an understanding that partners have to have some sort of shared vision in order to work together. And that shared vision relies on having a consensus on what the problem definition should be and what the policy solutions are. Um, and that in fact, the, la the lack of consensus on problem definitions and solutions is one of the key hindrances to collaborative processes. And so what the concepts of ideas and frames, which have already been well laid out, but I've put the definitions here as a reminder, what those two concepts offered for me was a way to consider how policy actors embrace their reality and how they construct policy interventions within that specific reality. Um, because of course, we, as, we under, as we've gone through this presentation, it's quite clear that ideas and frames shape how people view the world. And that type of meaning making gets absorbed into the policy process as well. And so ideas and frames were two concepts I could use to look at how the policy issue was understood. Um, what shaped preferences and policy objectives that were suggested, and what type of arguments were provided to support specific interventions, um, especially because this was an intersectoral policy issue. And so one could predict that there would be differing opinions on solutions. Um, and also because the policy itself was at the stage of decision making regarding interventions, so the policy formulation or adoption stages. And so these two concepts made sense for me to look at what um, happens during those stages. So I was quite new to the field of health policy research broadly and had never used discourse analysis before. And so I struggled in the beginning um, with particular issues. The first was how extensive, uh, which policy documents to look at, uh, which types, how many documents to consider. And for my particular policy, it was quite new into the policy sphere. And so I struggled with selecting um, how many documents because of the initiative itself wasn't well articulated in a number of policy texts, but was referred to as a broad goal or a broad agenda. Um, and then there was uh, struggling with the literature on which discourse element to actually analyze for. Um, do you look at frames? Do you look at ideas? Or do you look at other discourses? Um, and then, of course, within framing analysis, there's different types of analysis and uh, one has to select which specific one to, to use. Um, and in terms of time and history, I was in my study, I wanted to look at how the specific initiative evolved over time, but I wasn't quite sure how far back to look, how far to analyze, um, whether to consider the whole entire history of intersectoral agendas or not. And eventually what I settled for was the Schmidt typology of ideas, which allowed me to begin coding the documents uh, focused specifically on ideas at that stage. So what I uh, used was this understanding of ideas in three levels, that ideas can be policy solutions suggested to address the problem. And the second level involves specific policy programs which have their objectives and implementation plans, for example. And underneath those two levels is underlying worldviews which shape why particular solutions are suggested. And using this three typology, I could then start coding my policy documents as shown in this slide. Um, and using an Excel document to extract particular parts of policy text that referred to each um, code. In addition to that, because my study was focused broadly on intersectoral collaboration, I then extracted particular discourse that talked about intersectorality uh, because that allowed me to then have a further interpretation and link ideas, frames, and intersectoral strategies. Um, so this is just a slide to show what the eventual picture that emerged. And just to say at this stage that this, um, that once you do the coding process, you then realize that you have to link uh, 
what you have found back to your research question. And I think this is where this type of um, linking helped in my study and emerged after conversations with supervisors and in efforts when trying to write the first and second draft of the paper. Um, because I could then see that out of the ideas that were present in policy documents, that there were three main frames of how the policy issue was viewed and to link the three frames with different levels and of course, different intersectoral solutions or processes suggested. Um, and at the last stage, I, after submitting a paper, I then had you know, one of the reviewers ask, well, what does this mean for intersectoral action? What, are, are the three frames completely different or are they linked in any way? And this was a further level of interpretation to try and um, link whether the frames themselves were separate entities or whether they were linked in one particular way and what that meant for intersectoral collaboration. And in my case, there was a clear picture that all three frames were necessary for addressing the policy issue. But as they stood in policy texts, they were all separated. And that meant that you know, there wasn't a clear agenda for how to uh, address the past thousand days. And each specific frame had a specific intersectoral process attached to it. Um, and so this really you know, presented the issue that in dealing with intersectoral policies, there is a need to um, consider different interests and how those interests interact and how to navigate those um, different ideas and interests. Um, and lastly, a reflection on the process of it. I think it was very valuable for me to do this type of analysis while starting my interview process and while observing um, the policy process because I could then link what I was seeing from the documents and what was emerging from interviews. Um, it was helpful for me as a novice researcher to discuss some of these findings with my supervisors, with other mentors, with other peers. Um, and one of the main issues was trying to consider whether there were similar or contrasting ideas across documents and what that meant for the specific policy issue I was looking at. And through that, I was able to clearly see that there was an influence of global ideas at national level and at different iterations of the policy. But also the three points uh, really capture the, the fact that you have to be cognizant of where you're coming from as you, as you engage in this type of research, what type of assumptions you're carrying as, as Tanya said, and how this shaped the data collection process. Thank you very much. And just the last slide shows where the paper is for those who might want to read on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Aida, for that uh, uh, deconstruction of consensus um, in, your, in your research. Uh, I think it's really helpful and those practical tips about coding and putting them back together and looking for relationships, I think are something really, really helpful uh, for any researchers, uh, you know, setting out uh, to do policy analysis. I now call upon our next uh, speaker, um, uh, Sudha Ramani. Uh, Sudha is a PhD candidate uh, using uh, rhetoric analysis to understand the history of PHC policies in India and explore the disjuncture between policy framing and implementation studies. Uh, over to you, Sudha. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, listening in today. Uh, right after uh, Ida's wonderful presentation on intersectoral policies in South Africa, I am uh, very excited to bring to you all an example from India. Uh, this study was done as a part of my PhD, and its focus is on unpacking uh, the historical policy context that surrounds primary health centers in India. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on why uh, I wanted to examine the policy context historically. So way back in 1947, we envisaged this pyramidal health system in our country uh, where primary health centers would be the backbone and uh, they were supposed to be the front lines of care that delivered uh, preventive and curative care very close to the population. But today, if you see most of our outpatient care uh, happens in the private sector, um, 
and uh, a lot of infrastructural deficiencies have been documented at these uh, documented at these centers one of the questions i was asking was uh, why is it that this original policy vision of phc is not translate into reality today i looked at historical policy documents to see if there was a change in the kind of original vision that we had uh, for these phcs um, as of now so it was with this sort of um, idea in mind that i started looking at policy documents and asking this question okay uh, did the original policy vision that we had for primary health centers did it change over time and if it did change uh, why did it change uh, soon i realized that getting to this answer was not straightforward at all um, initially i tried looking at the content of different policies but this helped me make a timeline of what happened it was not really giving me answers to those why questions that uh, i was posing uh, the other issue that i was having with these policy documents was they all said primary health centers are important we should provide care close to people we should create such network and i started feeling that if policies really feel this way why is it that um, the, these centers are not given the sort of resources and attention that they need Uh, to thrive uh, it was then that i started exploring uh, discourse analysis and uh, during one of the workshops in cape town it was a health policy analysis workshop of uh, um, uh, of a phd fellowship uh, it was dr lucy jilson who suggested that uh, you know we could look at um, some of uh, maybe discourse as a method and uh, some of the first readings i looked at were fisher at uh, adam cooks paper and also baki's why study uh, problematic organizations okay and all this uh, sort of made me think that maybe we need to look at documents a little differently um uh, policies on the first glance we just look at them they look like they are stating facts and figures but when you actually relook at these policies from a discourse analysis perspective they have these hidden ideas and they are actually arguing uh, or making arguments to support some of these ideas so i thought maybe i could use discourse techniques to draw out these changing ideas so that i get a better understanding to my why question and this is where i began uh, my journey into discourse analysis and uh, i think lucky for me that uh, two more fellows but ida and elenor who's going to talk next uh, they were all trying to venture into um, discuss uh, this kind of analysis and um, i think we started uh, digging uh, together uh what struck me first was that discourse is not just one method uh, so when you look at discourse analysis it, there are several ways and techniques under a very uh, broad umbrella and uh, for each of our studies uh, we had to approach discourse analysis very differently we also uh, realized that ideational factors are very subtle and um, i think tanya mentioned this also that silence is what speaks uh, really loudly uh, for instance for me um, for for this particular study the uh, we had to, we uh, if i look at the first national health policy of india it was made in 1983 just after alma mata came so it is filled with primary health care and the principles and approaches of um, primary health care but the very next version of the policy even the word primary health care is not mentioned so uh this sort of silence speaks a lot and then we have to dig into more as to why this kind of silence occurs or why this kind of change occurs uh i think i was also having uh, some issues trying to define what exactly is a policy document for uh, you know uh, uh, we did not even have a national health policy till 1983 so but phcs were conceptualized much before that so should i start a little later or much earlier on in the prog uh, in the process of identifying policies uh in the end i think this is uh, this i just wanted to give an overview of the methodology i chose uh, i started with 13 national policy documents uh, all of which were in public domain and these were all prescriptive uh, in the sense that they they had some arguments for a way forward uh, another thing that helped me was 12 year 5 year these are more economic plans but they had a vision for the way forward which really helped me and we had this list of policy documents vetted by a few experts uh, who could tell me whether uh, this was adequate or not uh, after that uh, what i did was open coded and cut uh, 
you know, different themes from these documents, exactly the way uh, one would code an interview transcript in um, qualitative research. And uh, this this was in fact suggested by uh, Maylin in one of our, uh, who's who's there as a part of this forum also, and um, uh, to to just uh, to almost treat it like a qualitative uh, interview transcript and sort of code, but uh, instead of coding just. Um, uh, so I, I was specifically coding for ideas and changing ideas uh, or rather ideational factors in these uh, documents. Um, I also found out that uh, as I was going through it, I was also trying to arrange or group these ideas together in my mind. And I felt that these ideas could be arranged at different levels. Uh, so, so some of these ideas were about how health was conceptualized, you know. So is, is health looked at as a, say, development issue or is it uh, looked at as something, you know, specific um, to a particular sector uh, but some of them were also about um, uh, say how health systems were conceptualized you know whether uh, whether care should be comprehensive or selective or uh, we, we should provide care horizontally or vertically so uh, things like that there were also these macro political ideologies although these were at different levels they were they, they're also sort of interlinked for example say a uh, one way of looking at health uh, also informs the way we look at health systems so they also had these Pages. The, uh, the next step I sort of did was from the individual policy documents, I synthesized the information into five uh, discursive periods in history. This worked for me because um, this is how um, uh, uh, public health historians in, in India sort of uh, club these arguments and I use the same and I particularly looked for change in the arguments surrounding these PSCs. I think I mentioned this earlier but also the original set of documents that I had they did not really uh, have um, say uh, uh the why is very uh very distinctly put so i had to look uh beyond uh, the original set of documents into other documents to support the kind of arguments that i uh i wanted to put forth uh the other thing uh was that in my uh in my study particularly there was a lot of dissonance between the rhetoric and the action frames which was which were guiding policy solutions and this was happening even within the same document for for example, um, so uh, I, I mean, and rhetoric and action, I mean that, you know, the, what the policy said it believed in, like, um, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, we should have a comprehensive healthcare system and uh, it should be close to the community. So the, the beliefs in the policy and then the action that it recommended did not always match. So there was a clear mismatch there. Um, and so I, uh, I, I had to deal with this separately in, in my analysis. The last step that we did was also, the, I wrote this in the form of a narrative and, ha, and sought some expert opinions on what they thought about the whole, um, the whole construction of, uh, of the story. I think one big uh, learning for me has been that uh, uh, through this, uh, through this, uh, going through this process was that uh, policies are not really as coherent as uh, we uh, we uh, want them to be. In the ideas, and I thought the ideas and arguments would be very clear, and that was a very naive idea that. Uh, I had in my mind. So digging into ideas is a very uh, messy and iterative process, uh, but it's also a very uh, interesting process. And uh, I think this course opened uh, a new view into the policy documents, which I didn't have before. Uh, so it, it was a great, uh, a great, uh, it was, a, it's a great set of tools that uh, is worth exploring is what I would say. Uh, so thank you for listening in today. And uh, please, so uh, please give your comments, your thoughts, and any questions that you have, uh, they are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Sudha, uh, uh, for helping us understand how you uh, read documents differently. And interesting to see how actually discourse can even uh, translate into, you know, physical structures, uh, primary health centers in India. Uh, and their functioning. So I, I next call upon um, uh, Eleanor, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, Eleanor is a uh, PhD uh, uh, candidate conducting a longitudinal analysis of the national health insurance policy in South Africa to explore the influence of a polit political context on uh, policy discourse. Eleanor, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Thanks very much, Raquel. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be here and to share with you today. My name is Eleanor um, Wiley. I'm a UCT PhD student at the University of Cape Town in the Health Policy and Systems Division. And I'm um, in the middle of my PhD. And so I'm learning as I'm going and excited to share with you what I've learned so far. Um, so my case is the South African National Health Insurance Policy Process, which is a very long policy process that started in 1994, and the bill is still in Parliament as we speak. It's been characterized by a huge amount of contestation and resistance, so it's a very political policy process. And specifically, what I'm really interested in is the influence of social and political values on the policy process. and really how this plays out within complex social systems that we know health systems to be. So values are ideas that compel behavior. So a good way to understand them is just as a particularly powerful kind of idea. But ideational variables are challenging to study, as all my fellow panelists have already <laughs> expanded on. Um, and so I needed a way in to study social values, an approach that would allow me to account for them in the policy process. And critical discourse analysis presented the ideal methodology. And specifically, I started with Ruth Wodak as my entry point. And it really helped me to think of discourses as systems or patterns of communication. And for me, that was talk and text that exert power by regulating action and cognition. So um, discourses determine, and I think Michelle said this in her introduction, they determine what is doable, sayable, and thinkable. And by doing that, they enforce and reinforce existing power relations in society. And critical discourse analysis allows us to focus on the use of talk and text and signs and symbols in context, um, which is perfect for a health policy analysis looking at values because it's a way of seeing the influence of the ideational factors that explores issues of power in social context. And particularly, again, as Michelle said, in historical context, which was something I already knew from my reading on the values literature was going to be very important. So my study had two phases and the initial one was a, a review phase to build the theory and then I moved on to this case study phase which I'm um, in the middle of now which is really developed to test this uh, theory and it's a single embedded case study and so I collected uh, data on four units of analysis the social and political context the policy events um, the policy content and then the ideational factors so the discourse the argumentation and the rhetoric and I mapped all that information onto a timeline, which really helped me to start to see changes over time and the linkages between the changes in the ideational factors and the changes in the broader social and political context and the changes in the actual policy content. So the challenges were numerous, but I think I've got four kind of um, lessons that I'd like to share with you. So the first is that getting some temporal distance really helped. I was very worried that the ideational factors at play would be hard to see, but zooming out and taking a broad view helped a lot because, for example, if I look at the recent um, media um, on the NHI, it's difficult for me to sort of see the ideas that are, that are at play there. But if I go back to the 1990s, it's much easier to see that there was certain rhetoric being employed because that rhetoric is just a bit more foreign to me, so I can pick it out more easily. And it was then easy to see how that rhetoric was aligned with the interests of particular political actors. And then I could trace those ideas, so I could identify sort of ideas in the rhetoric, and then I could trace them forward, which helped me to see how they played out over time. So for example, um, in a January 93 uh, newspaper article, there's this idea of the ANC's health plan being unrealistic and idealistic. And this sort of construing of the NHI as naive and unserious is a discourse that continued to play out throughout the policy process, although the evidence um, presented in defense of that discourse started to change. Um, it also helped kind of because the macro level view allowed me to um, know what to be looking for a little bit. So for example, um, from a sort of historical standpoint, you can see that neoliberalism is hitting LMICs hard in the 90s, especially the early 90s. And this was really when the sort of uh, policy uh, agenda setting for NHI was taking place. And so once you know that, you know to look for neoliberal discourses in the um, 
in the in the policy process at that time. So it kind of pointed towards the discourses to look for. Another thing that really helped was to think of discourses as being a spectrum of ideas, rather than to think of it as being one block of idea, to think of it as being sort of a spectrum of almost opposing ideas. And this also helped to overcome the challenge of finding hidden values in the, in the policy process or finding the differences between espoused values and values in action. So for example, um, talk of social solidarity is often found as a challenging discourse within a larger discussion about freedom, the rights of the consumer, and like you get what you pay for. So those two discourses are at odds with each other. But once you see the more prominent one, you can also start to um, find the more challenging discourse that, that's hidden beneath. And then um, another example is um, arguments that pay lip service to the value of platforms for government um, delivery of care within a broader discourse that assumes the superiority of the private sector based on arguments that imply absolute trust in the market. Then my third lesson, I think, and I think um, Tanya mentioned this already, is to focus on actors. And for me, this idea came from Sherry Berman, that it's easier not to think of ideational factors as forces of nature, but to think of them as um, tools that are carried by certain actors. So they are tools wielded by powerful actors in line with their values, ideology, ideological commitments and interests. So if you're struggling to identify a discourse, in other words, to connect what's being said to broader issues of power in the social world, it's helpful to consider who's doing the talking and what their interests and ideological commitments are. And then lastly, um, one of the big challenges is that sometimes it's difficult to see the difference ideas make it's different to show that they that something happened because of the of the power of ideas and this is because in complex systems causality is complex um, an observed outcome like a policy change might have a number of contributing causes of which ideas are just one so what helped um in this regard was firstly to think of sort of a process tracing methodology which involves going deep into instances of decision making to understand the ideas that are, that are at play in those instances of decision making and then another, another tip for me was to remember that ideas are dynamic and adam mentioned this that they become instantiated over time in institutions in practices in ways of doing things and so they become if not just then at least sort of morally acceptable and this means that we can identify the power of ideas in practices and from there argue that the practice was causally significant so in the south african case um most parliamentarians in south africa are now members of medical aids and use private health services so that and that's a reflection of a value-based or value-laden idea about the supremacy of the private sector that connects with the kind of neoliberal discourse. But then that reality, those daily practice, then are powerful in that they undercut um, values-based arguments for radical restructuring that would shrink the private sector. So in that example, you've got an idea that becomes instantiated in a practice and therefore has a, has a, a sort of causal influence on the policy process. Thank you so much. These are two papers, my first two PhD papers. I'd love for you to take a look at them. And yeah, I'm excited to engage um, in the discussion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Eleanor. And I think uh, uh, you sort of rounded off the uh, four presentations very nicely uh, by, uh, by actually trying to get into the way, uh, sharing a way of actually uh, reaching uh, values, the question of values and their influence, uh, you know, on uh, policy um, itself, policy uh, itself, yeah. So uh, now uh, after those four very, very invigorating and very practical uh, presentations, uh, we now open up uh, for a panel discussion, uh, which will be moderated by uh, Adam. I call upon Adam to take over from here. Great, thank you, Raquel, and thank you for um... Uh, all of our uh, panelists. Um, I think if you could turn on your cameras. Everyone can see us now. Wonderful. Um, so uh, we've heard a lot of different approaches uh, to studying ideas, um, and in particular with an emphasis on discourse. Um, and I'll remind participants in this session as a skills building session, we're really focused on kind of how we're understanding the work we do. And we see this as a collective sense-making kind of enterprise. And we reflect uh, 
uh, on um, on ourselves. And I'd argue, and some people, uh, some panelists may blush because this does feel a little bit new, um, that we are all artists in conversation with our materials. So in that spirit, um, one of the goals of this discussion is to kind of pull out some practical lessons. Some, If somebody's starting this research, what are some of the things that you wish you would have known when you were starting this research, for example? Um, as a as a starting point, um, you know, we have uh, you know some themes across each of the presentations um, regarding the translation of ideas into um, uh, structures or processes, um, and looking at how they evolve uh, kind of over time. Um, so I didn't know if uh, who wants to talk a little bit more. Um, I think you know Suda talks a l uh, very clearly on the way that structure ideas are absorbed into structures. Um, but how did you go about identifying those discourses, for example, uh, Suda? Um, and, and, and how did you uh, uh, determine the, the sources of your data for making that? Um, uh, uh, those, uh, those insights. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, I think that's a very important question. Uh, how did I identify uh, sources um, uh for answering this kind of complex question mm -hmm. so initially i had um uh, i started off with the uh, uh, list of uh, policy documents and i i didn't know so uh, one thing about uh, as i mentioned earlier was that the far first health policy in india came only in 1983 so that was our official uh, first official national level policy document but even before that just uh, just before our independence in 1946, uh, we, we had this very comprehensive vision of the primary health, uh, sorry, of the health system in uh, uh, in the country that was laid out. It was called the Board Committee Report. And uh, this was the first time that, um, uh, that primary health centers were uh, sort of conceptualized uh, in, in the Indian setting. And I think some of the ideas we borrowed from the you know, National Health Service in the UK. Uh, so uh, that was the way it was, um, it was initially designed. So I decided that because this is the first point uh, where PSEs were conceptualized, uh, let me start from there and see how they uh, sort of progress. So that was one uh, this thing. I know like Ida and other people have shorter time frames, but I think we had to really go long uh, into a longer historical time frame and this was also mainly because um, uh, the, uh, what happened to primary health centers today I cannot explain only with the recent policies because it's 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 a very old age-old institution and has a legacy of um, you know a, a very uh, an old legacy of what it was supposed to be and uh, where it has come now so it changed a lot over time so once I had uh, once I started there I started a uh, the initial list was using my own uh, familiarity with, uh, you know, the Indian policy scenario. But we also got it vetted by, uh, but and also my PhD contributed to it and we then we got the list vetted by three experts so one was a more academician and then the other person was a uh, policy maker and the third person was also a civil society member so that we can get a mix of perspectives on whether uh, we see um, you know whether this will make a, a good jumble of documents but once I got to those documents those could um, those could not tell me a full detail so I still had to go uh, let's say if, if, I, if I found a point like um, you know, for example, I had mentioned that, you know, in our uh, 2002 health policy, the primary health care word was completely missing from it. And uh, the PHC the, as a building completely derives from that kind of philosophy and uh, it, that was completely missing. Uh, uh, when something like this happens, I have to go beyond, look at not just the policy document, but what happened in the context around that, you know, what, what was happening in the world around that and uh, why is it that, uh, you know, this kind of uh, change has taken place. And the other thing was sometimes there's also a time lag. If something happens in, say, is reflected in a policy document the context surrounding this happened say five years or six years ago so i had to even account for that and then take those uh, to take those documents into account so it was a very iterative process uh, through which we got the uh, question answered does that make sense or uh, yes that's helpful yeah. um, and i think uh you know if we could um also mm -hmm. Everybody, does anybody else want to reflect on the sources they used for their data? 
um, and how they were able to identify these larger, I mean, uh, clearly, Eleanor, um, you also took a, a historical approach with um, and had to map it into a very um, comprehensive timeline. Um, how did you decide yeah. on, uh, on, on that approach? It seemed to be I a guess, turning point in your research. I, I guess I knew that, that um, I always knew that the, that why the NHI in South Africa made a good case study for the influence of values in particular was that it was such a long policy process because, and, and one born out of a particular historical moment, um, obviously in 1994, that had these like ideological commitments that that um, that uh, sort of formed the the policy process in the first place, and so the the need to to look backwards or to take a long view um, was kind of embedded in the like the the kind of foundational idea of the study, which is that if you take a long view, these the influence of of social and political um, values will become clear because. One of the things I, I knew from reading a lot about social values in kind of sociological and social psychology literature was that they don't always change. They, they hardly ever change fast. They change slowly um, at the sort of national level, at the societal level. And so therefore the influence of them is hard to see unless you take a long view. And then the kind of um, the, the benefits of taking that long view, I didn't expect at all, but the ability to really um, get some distance from the material that just looking back 25 years gives you was really helpful in terms of doing discourse analysis, which I think one of the kind of common challenges is that you're too, as, a, as the analyst, you're too much in the discourse to be able to take a step back and, and see it. And um, so that kind of distance was really helpful. And then, um, in terms of what uh, what materials you need, I think I like um, I think Tanya, you said the same thing that originally it seemed like it was going to be fine to just focus on the policy documents and look at the changes in the rhetoric and the discourse in the policy documents over time. And actually, policy documents are such weird um, things to analyze because they are so sort of controlled and they don't say what they mean really there's so much hidden there and it's really difficult to unpack but then if you combine that and this is what Suda was saying if you look at that look at the policy document in its historical context so combine it with like history readings like you know academic literature from the faculty <laughs> the history department um, then suddenly you start to see what else was going on at the time and start to see sort of what could be spurring the kind of subtle differences that you're seeing in the policy documents. And then again, the kind of looking more at the more informal um, sources, so like media analysis, things like um, submissions to committees and stuff like that, where people speak a little bit more freely and kind of betray their ideological commitments a bit more readily. And then once you know what you're looking for, you can start to find them in the policy documents themselves a little bit more. But again, that all just happened Thanks, that because very, I started and then it response. suddenly became clear that it wasn't going to be possible to just look at the policy documents. Um, so I want to shift a little bit. To, there's some, been some questions on meaning making. Uh, and I think it's important to flag um, kind of what we mean by meaning making, but also and how... Oh, um, and also how we understand actors in the policy process. And both Tanya um, and Ida, I, did, I don't know if you wanted to speak a little bit to um, uh, identifying actors and understanding how either they create meaning or how um, the researcher and research kind of co-generate meaning. Um, yeah, I can go, I can go fast. Um, so I think for me, meaning making was an important part of the policy, especially because it was an intersectoral, you know, idea that rose onto the political agenda. And so what that meant was that policy actors had to then, you know, view the problem in a certain way and in a way generate solutions. So apply sort of a problem solving, you know, way to um, try and look at what possible solutions can be suitable for this particular problem. Um, and I think that's the core of this type of analysis, because then you realize that actors have different views of what the policy issue should be, what the problem should be defined and what, what solution should be suitable. 
Um, and that type of contestation is what plays out in a lot of this decision making spaces. Um, and I think seeing that and, and viewing how actors bring in their own uh, interests and how they those interests sometimes are linked to, you know, their understanding of, of a particular issue um, that could be linked to an institution, to a particular sector. Um, so how, for example, uh, an actor from the health sector views a policy for early childhood versus an actor from um, development or early childhood sector looks at the same issue could be influenced by which sector they are positioned in. Um, and seeing how active that process is as a researcher, then it, it, it sort of forces you to acknowledge the whole interpretive element of, of policy making and then of how you conduct that type of research. Um, I think that's how meaning making for me unfolded in my process. Um, and then also as you analyze, then you also acknowledge that you also bring in your own you know, view of the world while you are doing the analysis process. And so it becomes a, a conversation and, navig and you navigate those different forms of um, trying to construct the reality for both actors and for both you as the researcher. Um, I think that's how I viewed it in my case. Um, I'll build on that. Thanks, Ida, um, for starting the conversation. I think for us, um, the initial mapping of the various policies along a timeline um, and the various actors involved really painted a very complex picture um, and a very diverse picture of multiple actors with multiple perspectives. And really starting with that kind of contestated space, multiple discourses within that. Um, we really worked with the notion that um, policies are created through processes um, and these multiple actors have ideological positions, um, you know, explicit and implicit, um, and these are reflected in the policy text that we began to analyze, but really looking at the very dynamic and complex nature and the multiple actors that um, are in the adolescent health landscape. Uh, looking at, you know, we also classified policy documents um, along a continuum of whether they are gender responsive or, you know, versus gender transformative. Um, and really getting, you know, getting a picture of the diverse perspectives, how these are classified, how adolescence is understood, how health is understood. Uh, you know, so really painting a very complex picture just based on what was in the policy documents. Um, so that raised many questions for us in terms of the discourses um, and then really understanding how these discourses are created and constructed and are contested um, and are multiple. So really not, not a simple picture, um, you know, and then from that looking really at the gender discourses, but we also identified a number of discourses um, across the spectrum in terms of how various actors understood health, how they understood adolescence. And then that, that informed the solutions really how you know how they understood the problems so um yeah so definitely and as i said in my next paper it's really going to be foregrounding the interview data the actor narratives um and and to also look triangulate that against the policy documents so i'll keep you posted great thank you tanya um so one of the things that i've struggled with in my own research is uh, on framing is is it's it's really helpful for understanding um, where people are directing their where policy where attention is directed in the policy process, but it's sometimes difficult to understand where attention is being directed away from. Um, and we we've, we've had some questions, and some of you have alluded to it, but I didn't know if if we wanted to discuss a little bit more about how you identify kind of those silent spaces or who's being left out of discourse. Um, and as you make those judgments, um, uh, by what, what criteria are you using? Um, and this, is, this will also, I think, uh, 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 help drive the field of inquiry in this space because it is one of the tricky methodological problems. Would anybody um, uh, like to um, share their thoughts first? I can get the conversation going. So I think that's sure. a really interesting question. Uh, so thank you for raising that. I think, as I mentioned, our initial analysis was really just to map um, a whole range of discourses that we could identify. And again, that was an interpretive process. 
but then to begin to look at the relationship. So how a dominant discourse um, can, you know, quiet out or shut out um, a less uh, marginalized discourse and how those interactions also create silences. So these are not static, um, you know, discourses or silences. Um, so, for example, a, a dominant discourse in our research was that um, that, that adolescent health really is actually gets reduced to being about girls and about problems and risks. Um, and so that so the discourse about adolescent health being about wellness um, and about adolescents in their diversity, uh, you know, is becomes a more marginalized discourse. Uh, we also found, for example, how uh, dominant discourses um, around gender as equating biological sex or something that's fixed and categorical, um, you know, marginalizes discourses that are about gender as fluid um, and gender as more socially constructed. Uh, you know, so always working with this, this dynamic between these. Um, we also notice, for example, um, you know, some of these discourses existed within a policy and some of them existed across the policy document database. So that was also some of the kind of intertextual and interdiscursive complexities. Um, but really beginning to say, what are the implications of a dominant discourse in South Africa, for example, which is a big HIV discourse. So that discourse is, constructs, um, you know, the interest in LGBTQI plus adolescents really um, around HIV, you know, so really beginning to understand how both the contextual discourses and the discourses in policy create a dominant, marginalized version and silences out other discourses, which has implications for services and for subjectivities. So let me stop there for now. I just wanted to add briefly on that because I was reflecting on how sometimes it's easy to assume that what is missing is missing because it's um, it's kind of the challenging discourse and it's uh, um, it's um, you know against the interests of the powerful actors. But sometimes what's missing is missing because it's in the interest of powerful actors for it to be missing. And I think with the national health insurance, um, the sort of policy discourse also certainly in the arguments that are made for um, or against. Uh, the national health insurance, one of the things that's often sort of surprisingly not there is the 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 arguments that have to do with the with the serious shortcomings of the private sector. And that can only be because there are vested interests in those kind of shortcomings not becoming uh, part of the discourse. So, but again, I think that Tanya's right that, you know, that the, the maybe this is a little bit theoretical, but that discourses are designed to silence and they are designed to promote someone's interest and to silence someone else's interest. But because of that, they contain within them the, the challenge or the challenging discourse. So once you've found the dominant discourse, it's kind of easy to, easier at least to see what it's, what it's working against, what it's trying to silence. Um. Yeah, I was going to add on to that and say, but then there's also the obvious fact that you could be looking for a specific thing and just not find it, like the primary healthcare um, issue of SUDA, that you actually enter the policy, policy text looking for a specific thing. I was looking for intersectoral collaboration strategies, how this would unfold, and you it would just be missing on its own. And that gives you a clear indication of, you know, what's missing in that particular picture and, and prompts you to dig deep into why that's the case. Yeah, I, I, I completely, I, I think my my um, study was a little bit like I does in that way. So I could easily, uh, not easily, but I could make out um, what was missing at different uh, different points in time. But I wouldn't say it was missing. So, it, uh, uh, so primary healthcare kept coming and then it would disappear and then it would come again and it would disappear. So these, uh, so it was almost like discourses are getting recycled uh, uh, once in a while. And uh, uh, I think for me, uh, the question was to ask why. So if a discourse is saying something or, or you know something is dominating the discourse, why is it that 
that uh, uh, you know it was correct for people at that time to say it. You know, it was politically correct for them to say it at that time. And why is it that at that at this time it is not okay for them to say the same thing? And you know, what what has sort of changed between then? That was what uh, was interesting for me to uncover. Thanks, Adam. Yes, Raquel. Yeah, uh, I just uh, wanted to jump in with a very quick uh, practical uh, point that what I found very useful in uncovering uh, the silences and uh, legitimizing them or, you know, sort of adding some weight to what I thought I didn't see was to use a sort of iterative process with some of my interviewees. So some of the actors, uh, you know, I, I developed, a, you know, over time a relationship with in terms of uh, being able to go back with some of my findings saying, hey, you know, these are the silences I'm seeing. Does it make sense to you? And, and that, I think, uh, really helped uh, affirm uh, or point me to, okay, maybe you should talk to such and such a person or look in such and such a document. And, you know, so that was very helpful. I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Thanks, Raquel. Am I back? I, I froze a little bit, I think. <laughs> um, so this, the, uh, one of the points that you raised, I think that would be helpful to explore is um, you, you felt like you were on the right track by sharing your findings with somebody who is uh, part of the research endeavor. Um, in this case, a, uh, an, an, uh, an interview participant. Um, I wondered if, if we all could kind of shift our attention a little bit to focusing on how do we know then what we're seeing is true? Um, and how do you know when it's sufficient to generate like kind of usable insight? Um, how about uh, uh, Ida? <laughs> yeah, I was just about to unmute. <laughs> um, I think for me, it was a conversation with my supervisors. Um, so initially I started with a very bulky Excel document when I did the coding process. And in that Excel document, I, I had one column that was just notes on what I think, you know, this could generate. So what narrative or, or what level of, you know, thinking I was at at that moment. Um, and then sharing that bulk document with one, with one of my supervisors and sitting and thinking about how to partition the narrative and what makes sense in that, se in that way. Um, I think that helped me um, you know, think about whether what I had found made sense. Um, what also helped me was that I had a, a high number of documents. So after doing, you know, 20 or so documents, you start to see a pattern emerging in some sort of way that helped a little bit. But the conceptualization at the end, so what I had at the end, that, that table that I showed, that took a long time of conversation and also writing the paper. So once I started writing the paper, I realized, you know, how do you actually put in this narrative and what do you want to start with? What do you want to end with? And that forces you to, to think about the data that you have and the best way to maximize it. So one of the things I realized actually is when I looked at annual reports of provincial sectors, I could very easily see how my policy had changed over one year, two years. Um, and that, you know, schematic, that diagram becomes a very clear picture of you know, what you're seeing is, is what's happening because you can show from the data itself. So that's how I, I went through my process. Great, would anybody like to build on that? I, I'll, um, just quickly, I'm not quite there yet because um, I'm still in the middle of my analysis, but I think that we've all said that it, it helps to, and like Raquel was saying, it helps to go back to other actors and to check what's emerging with them. And I guess there's kind of that on the one hand, and then there's, well, if you're taking a social constructivist view, then you are of the belief that you have, what you're trying to do is to construct a narrative that makes sense, that explains where we find ourselves, that explains the social world that we find ourselves in. And so as long as when you check it with people who, who have first-hand experience or who have a longitudinal knowledge of these policy processes, that it's 
sort of resonates with their experience, then that can be true at the same time as it can be possible that there might be have been an alternate uh, interpretation or, or a competing narrative um, that might have emerged for a different researcher. And that kind of has to be okay. Maybe I can add to the conversation. Um, just building on what Ida and Eleanor have said, I think the process of doing interpretive research really requires um, us to position ourselves in the research process um, and really understand our positionality. So um, part of that included for me immersion in, in the data, lots of walking and lots of thinking through, you know, what is this about um, in terms of my own researcher journey. Um, and then also, as Eleanor mentioned, we, you know, our position was not about looking for one truth or one reality. We completely work from the post-structuralist position that there are multiple truths and multiple realities. Um, as researchers, our task is really to describe a very thick um, and rich story that explained our findings and explained what we understood this to be um, and to give it a meaningful interpretation um, you know, a, a rich description of the context that helped understand um, our arguments and our findings, um, etc. So we, our starting point was not to find one truth or one reality, but to work with the notion of, of post-structural, po you know, multiplicities of knowledge. And also with the um, Carol Bucky's approach, um, it's really about not defining the problem or the solution. You know, it's not about evaluating but beginning to understand what it means to, um, you know, to do interpretive research, to understand ideologies, beliefs, policy processes. Um, so definitely, I mean, I think it's really important. And then to have colleagues, um, both within health policy and systems research, but also those in gender studies, for example, or those who are more methodological um, scholars in sociology or discourse analysis, to really, to think for, you know, for this audience, what is it, that I need to write um, and, and communicate with and what is it that um, I'm sharing uh, from my research. So thanks, I'll stop. Uh, I'll just add to what um, Tanya said. I think she said the part about uh, positionality really, really well. Uh, I, honestly, I struggled a lot with this. I kept thinking that um, because I'm looking at historical policy documents, I could I could be interpreting Britain them completely wrong because uh, uh, and uh, 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 I think I couldn't make up my mind. So I thought one, uh, uh, despite a lot of reflection and uh, talking to a lot of people and listening. So I decided that I would uh, do an expert validation. I'll get my narrative say, checked by two, three people and see if uh, it sort of rings true with them. Uh, something that also happened during that process was that my experts did not agree with each other. In fact, one or two of them uh, almost started fighting. It, it was very difficult for me to uh, then put in all the opinions together. So I think uh, when we are doing interviews, the interpretative approach was much easier for me because I, I could also judge the person where they are coming from and that sort of interaction uh, made me, uh, you know, that observation made me uh, sort of take quicker decisions, you know, some intuitive decisions I could take, which I found it much harder with uh, policy documents because uh, um, they are more more texts and you haven't met the person who has documented them. Thank you. Uh, Rakha, you had something to say? Uh, no, just that uh, I think it's uh, just to uh, again uh, reflect on uh, something that was useful for me is to uh, like you know we all said to go back to the you know one or two people but also to identify I think like Sudha mentioned briefly in a presentation to have these go-to people actually from very different sectors. So to have someone from say an activist sector to have a bureaucrat to have an academician and, and, and begin to see the differences in their interpretation, like Sudha said, probably, you know, actually even, you know, having a big disagreement. But to, to me, that was the most useful uh, part of the research on why did they disagree, you know, and, and, and so on. So, so I think a little bit of strategic, uh, you know, positioning of ourselves um, and, and the support group we build uh, around us 
I think helps a lot in, uh, you know, at least affirming even to ourselves, giving us the confidence of saying that, okay, this is what, you know, we, we believe. Yes, I do um, think. Oh, I just wanted to add, sorry, Adam, um, no, no, about no. sort of relating to the, the, to the issue of positionality um, and uh, I just thought it would, it's also useful to contextualize where the the data came from. So um, this would be different depending on what your data was. Um, it's especially important. I think somebody in the questions asked about uh, the data, for example, um, um, interview transcripts and that. So describing very clearly the context in which the interviews took place or if, it, if it's policy documents, when the policies came about and that kind of links to the importance of the historical analysis. So situating the data within the context kind of helps to um, to, I don't necessarily think it, it makes it more true, but it would provide a, a, a better understanding of how those different truths came about um, for the reader to be able to assess. Um, yeah, so that's just what I thought was. Yeah, thanks. I think this is a helpful discussion. And, you know, one of the, one of the ways I, I know for my myself, how I can kind of um, come to an interpretation of conflicting pieces of data or rival accounts of the policy process is oftentimes um, is, you know, in ethnographic inquiry, you're oftentimes in pursuit of kind of these elements of thick description, people that can tell you lots of details and do some of the interpretive work linking to these broader concepts provide pretty pr convincing accounts of of why things are happening. And oftentimes this insight is only generated through first and experience. Um, so while I, I, I think it's important to remain critical, um, there are people who know a lot more about something than somebody else. Doesn't mean their interpretation's right, but uh, it's hard. It's oftentimes those thicker, more detailed accounts are hard to dispute. So we're talking about um, kind of trustworthiness and interpretation and um, and issues on kind of the tail end. We typically associate with the tail end of research. But there's still quite a few questions on the front end of the research. Um, and because this is kind of an abductive logic of inquiry, where we cycle back and forth between data and text and theory, um, I was wondering if you all could reflect a little bit on how you got, how you did get kind of research off the ground. And this might be for somebody who's maybe just started a PhD program or interested in applying to one or um, fairly uh, new to this type of research and is like, where do I begin? Does anybody want to talk about um, how they identified sources or um, where what they use as their starting point? Um, and there are questions about the specific sources, whether the social media can form a basis of this, whether it's media transcripts themselves, reports, um, you know, how you decide to interview versus use documents to inform your analysis. Um, I think I can, I can go first. Um, so for me, I when I came into the PhD program, I stumbled upon this policy issue literally by going to a, a meeting of stakeholders um, who were debating about particular strategies for this specific policy. And so my entry into the field was through the observation of a policy process and repeated observations before I could even construct my research proposal. Um, so then all I had at that time was meeting agendas and meeting um, transcripts, well, records of meetings, um, and then some policy documents that had emerged from those specific meetings. And so it made sense for me to begin with the policy documents, because once the research proposal was approved, that was the first source of data I had uh, while waiting and while trying to decide actually who the interview respondents would be. And so the, the documents for me was an exploration of, of, the, of how the rest of the research process would unfold, which actors would I interview, where to start. Um, and so I started with policy documents. But what happened was because I took such a long time, you know, to, to analyze, to do this discourse analysis, that the interview started catching up to the policy documents. And so it, it allowed for that loop. So then I could piggyback, I could ask interview info informants about any extra documents. I could show them the list of what I was analyzing and ask whether there, there was documents I was missing and where to go from that. So that's how I, I did my process. It just happened that 
you know, that, that was what practically made sense for me and ended up wa working out. But because I was analyzing a policy that was unfolding quite quickly, I then towards the end of my interview, after the interviews were done and just before the thesis was written, I had to go back to the new documents that had been released that I hadn't done in the initial analysis. Um, and then to confirm that the story was all complete. Um, and that's how I, I did it in my study. Thanks, Adam. I just I can think I can add that maybe what's helpful is, well, or at least what's been helpful for me, and I agree with Ida that it, I think as much as one tries to sort of lay out and I know not all PhD programs work like this, but and not everyone who does discourse analysis <laughs> does it for their PhDs. But um, that it, although you know one tries to lay out your methodology at the start of your project and then follow it as as you'd laid it out, um, but kind of maybe because of the of the nature of of what you're looking for, the the need to start bringing in different sources kind of just happens as you start to read and as you start to immerse yourself. And one of the things that I think helped me a lot was to keep going and still, I mean, I still do this, is to keep going back to the theory. So kind of, I have like a body of theory on social values and a body of theory on discourse analysis and a body of sort of methodological theory on case studies. And keeping on going back to that is really helpful to kind of, just as a reminder of like what's what's pos what's possible, what what different things you could be drawing in, and what different ways you could be finding to analyze them or to compare them against one another, um, and I think it's it's you know that kind of iterative um, approach in which you are almost learning about the theory, sort of the learning of the theory um, and the learning of the content of your study go hand in hand, um, because it really helps you to maybe deepen your analysis by constantly going back to your theory. So yeah, maybe I can add, I'm just watching the time, I'll be brief. Um, so I think for me, I have come to my, my studies um, from a place of practice, you know, so um, from working in the field and that's drawn me back to, you know, wanting to do a PhD, to have an opportunity to think deeply and grapple. And this is why these spaces are, are really appreciative. So, so thank you for that. Um, I think in my personal experience, I also had a pre PhD year where there was just lots of conversation, a very broad, um, you know, space that was created by institutions that I uh, belong to. Um, and have different relationships with different stakeholders and actors. So um, that, that opportunity to, to think broadly, read widely um, was very helpful as a pre-doc year. Um, and then picking up on Eleanor's point, I think within health policy and systems research particularly, uh, we have to recognize these huge disciplines and trajectories and histories um, of gender studies, in my case, for example, uh, you know, decolonial studies, uh, discourse and critical discourse policy studies, Adam, you mentioned, to really to actually recognize the theoretical antecedents. I mean, read Foucault if you've got, you know, time and energy and, and really read the critiques of that. So um, see those journeys as part of your own development. They may not end up in your paper, as I've learned, but um, they make for good for good thinking and reading and ultimately good conversations. Thanks, Tanya. I just have a quick thing. I, I think like Ida, I didn't budget enough time for a discourse analysis. Um, uh, it uh, so in for for me the entry into discourse was because I was trying to answer this question on why PhDs with not getting, uh, you know, not uh, today we're not what we visualize them to be. And uh, I just thought I'll briefly look at the policy documents to see what's happening. But that brief look just turned into a long, uh, a whole chapter in the PhD. And uh, it needed a lot of time for iteration. There was a lot of dissonance. There was a lot of incongruence that I had to come and deal with. So anybody who starts off, you know, with this kind of methods, I would say budget enough time for that because it does take a lot of time to uh, go through these things and 
uh, you know, uh, a lot of reflection and ideas. And then you, it, it's not just one method that exists. You have to adapt from different methods and sort of see what, what best fits your research question. Thanks, Sudan. I think this is helpful for me. I mean, so I'm hearing lots of things. And um, one is that we have to be a little bit deductive to get started. Um, and this might be based on our experience or our question, but you can't do everything all at once. But over time, you can keep cycling back and building your understanding. So we all need sponges. The important thing is to kind of clarify how you're seeing that through the process and how your interpretation is evolving. Um, Raquel, I don't know if we have time for one quick, one more quick question. And that's... Um, it, yeah, I think we could go ahead. We, I think we have 10 minutes to the okay. close. So you should, we could just take time to answer questions. That, that's fine. So what's really helpful, I think, about all of uh, all of the panelists research is that they're at different stages, actually. Um, uh, so you're coming to this uh, meeting kind of through, um, you know, at a certain point in time, but it's not the same for the research endeavor. Um, so uh, looking back, um, if you would have uh, one thing that you could tell somebody, one short piece of advice who was um, uh, pursuing discourse analysis or other ideas-based modes of research, what would it be that you that you wish you would have known when you were getting started? I'll start. Yeah, go for it, Tanya. First word that came to mind, it's be comfortable with complexity. Don't look for simplicity. I can go next to sorry, so maybe to say just that everything takes, this process of sponging takes time because your brain, and maybe it's linked to Tanya's point, your brain takes time to make sense of complexity. Those, um, It's not going to just leap off the page and into your brain and then you're going to write it up. Um, and so it's almost like you can't actually tell how long it's going to take before the ideas that you're seeing around you in the policy process start coalescing into a narrative that makes sense and i think the biggest gift you can give yourself is just take the time you need although you know in the modern world it's really tough but that it's that it takes its own time to make sense uh, i think that i'm just building on Eleanor's and Tanya's point again, that uh, it is complex and it takes time, and uh, but not to be scared of uh, it because real world policies are um, uh, are complex. They, they are made for certain audiences, so they don't say a lot of things. They say a lot of things which they don't mean. Uh, they don't take action on half the things they say. So it's not like frames and ideas and discourse is going to pop out on you and say, hey, these are the four kinds or five kinds. So it, it, it does take a lot of uh, time and engagement and a lot of confusion that we go through before uh, you find, make some meaning of it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I think I'll just steal someone's um, uh, point in the discussion forum and say, create a support group and talk to as, uh, as many people as you can <laughs> while you're being brave in taking on this method. Yeah. yeah, maybe I can just jump in to say that uh, I think to me, one of the things that really helped was to be curious all the time. Um, I think you need to be not brave, but you should be curious enough to follow those little winding paths away from the main path, uh, you know, because most of my most, uh, you know, useful theories or research or ideas came from stuff that was not part of my planned reading, uh, you know, and, and that to me, I think really helped uh, a lot. And the second point, please make notes all the time, because that, you know, at the end of when you're writing, it's really helpful to go back to what you wrote in your first year and second year and have that, you know, uh, if not, you sort of tend to lose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. These are all really helpful. I'd also just remind people that knowledge acquisitions oftentimes tacit. So we can't see what we're learning always and how advanced our understanding is. All we see is all the shortcomings with our understandings, but to somebody else, it might be a pretty well-developed understanding. So don't be too hard on yourself uh, during this process as well. So I think with that, we have about five minutes left. Um,
Does anybody have any concluding thoughts they've wanted to share and haven't had a good opportunity to share? Can I, um, maybe this is almost a question for Adam, but in your intro, Adam, you said, you said um, institutions are congealed ideas. <laughs> and I really like the way you phrased that. And I think we've been grappling maybe today with the tension between um, and I think one of the questions as well in the chat was that, you know, do ideas spur change or do they constrain change? Are they are they slow moving and, and path dependent and resistance or are they the things that suddenly come up and and and, you know, bring about a change? And maybe if you want to share a reflection on just the yeah, the complexities around that. Sure. And I think I think also the interest as being constitutive of ideas is complicated. Um, I, I do. Uh, I do understand that um, when institutions, when ideas are institutionalized in, in practice, um, it, it's part of the nature of ambiguous ideas and why I talk about them being at uh, several levels. When people talk about ideas, sometimes they mean values, sometimes they mean ideologies, sometimes they mean actually a very specific line uh, in a document. Um, uh, sometimes, um, you know, so they take on different form. And I think that's why um, all of you have done a nice job of characterizing uh, how complicated this process is. Um, but I, I would argue that it shouldn't be simple. Uh, you know, the social reality is complicated. The world is a very strange place uh, to most of us. Um, and so our analysis should, um, you know, reflect that um, and shouldn't be afraid of trying to uh, provide a situated understanding of that, that, that complexity. Thanks, Eleanor. Does anybody else have anything to um, build on that about the nature of, of kind of change um, and uh, whether ideas uh, are slow, fast, how they shift or assemble, uh, assume different forms over time? Uh, maybe I'll just jump in here because there was, there was also a question uh, on, on, on compl complexity um, and uh, you know the complexity and how that works with ideas. And I think one of the important points, uh, I mean, again, is to is to sort of, uh, I think, um, embrace conflict. Uh, you know, embrace the fact that uh, there is going to be confusion, and uh, embrace the fact that there are going to be months when you just can't make sense of, you know, what you're reading, and or that gut feeling of something's missing, something's missing, something's missing, you know. Uh, I think those are sort of uh, gut level reactions as researchers that we really need to hold on to uh, and, you know, talk about and share. I think these are all very important, uh, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, come back to, uh, you know, some of the key ideas, uh, you know, that we are. I think uh, too much of, uh, you know, rational, uh, you know, a very comprehensive rationality type of thinking, uh, you know, uh, has dominated, I think, uh, uh, policy uh, you know, analysis. And I think uh, to me, at least, uh, you know, as a trained medical doctor to, uh, to add, uh, I think this course was a real liberation in terms of, you know, uh, being able to plumb new depths. Well, thank you all. I've learned a lot through this discussion today as well. Um, and it's been really fun to be a part of this group. Uh, um, so as a reminder, I believe, Raquel, did, um, did you have some concluding thoughts or uh, as a reminder about our toolkit or? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I think it's, it's, it's not going to be easy to sort of put this wonderfully rich session uh, in which I think all of us have learned so much, leave with a few uh, just uh, reminders for, uh, we, we are hoping to, no, no, we are putting together a toolkit uh, of resources that each one of us found useful, uh, uh, probably also some notes uh, regarding some of the questions that came out. Uh, we may not have been able to answer every single question. Uh, there were some very specific questions which we will definitely get back to you. So please make sure you have left your uh, email IDs in the discussion forum so that we can get back to all of you uh, over uh, email. And uh, I really want to thank, uh, first of all, all of you for uh, being here with us, 
putting keeping the questions going and uh, you know really encouraging us to think and reflect also the technical team for uh, you know managing this and of course to this wonderful bunch of discourse analysts who sort of come together around this session and I, I really look forward to keeping in touch and building the field as we go along uh, thank you thank you all thank you thank you so much Bye.